this is the Recovery Connection Saving Our Souls. I'm Miss Leslie, and Miss Finisha is on her way. So I'm going to start off with a psalm. Got to put the eyes on, otherwise I can't read it. I got. I have a. I have a couple, but I will do no, Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise His name. Proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all the people. For the Lord is great and most worthy of praise. And. Um, the reason why I wanted to start off with that one, for those of you who are not from the Boston area, um, we had a rally, peace march, um, a gathering this Saturday, and um, basically it was a response to what had happened at Charlottesville, and I didn't personally go, um, I had another commitment, but I knew a lot of people that did go, and I watched it on TV, and it, it was marvelous. It just showed the power of God. He came there. He showed up. He showed out. And <clears throat> the main thing that I got from listening to people and watching, you know, what the media showed is that darkness can't be with light. You know, the people that, you know, said they had the right to free speech, yeah, you do. But you can't spread hate. They came. They weren't even. They were only there an hour. They could not stay. The Holy Spirit would not let them stay. It would not let them spew that hate and venom and that discord that they did in Charlottesville. And one of the things I had said in my prayer that morning was that Boston might have its flaws and its faults. But we are one of the cradles of liberty in this country. And, and there's just some stuff we will not accept. And after the marathon bombing, this city, this state, this region has come together. You know, the tagline is Boston Strong. And that's how we are. You know, like I said, we might have our differences and all of that. But when a crisis comes, when an emergency happens, we get together. All of that stuff gets dropped to the wayside and we come together as people, you know, as God's people to do whatever the task is needed. And what I liked about that, it was more secular organizations that, was, that pulled this event together. But they couldn't have done it without God. You know, there were so many people creed of different creeds, nations, uh, sexual identities, classes, um, men, women, children. They just came together for one purpose, to say, not here, not in my house. So that was the beautiful thing. But God was in it. He showed up, showed out, and let folks know that you can get along. You can have peaceful coexistence. And when something is wrong, people are going to speak up. They're not going to be complacent. So that was, that was the beauty of that. And I give kudos to Mayor Walsh for his maturity in this situation. I give kudos to Governor Baker for his wisdom in this situation. And Police Commissioner Evans, he made sure we were tight. You know, he had his officers out there and his detectives to make sure that there were no acts of violence. And from what I understood, there were one or two, uh, well, a few instances, but they handled it right away so that nothing got out of hand. Nothing became catastrophic. So like I said, that was God. He had to show up among the midst of his people. And if secular people can put something together like that and do it peacefully, why can't the church? We need to get together and, and never mind what denomination we are or whatever. We're kingdom folks. We're kingdom kin. And we need to lead. We need to lead these marches. We need to lead these discussions. We need to be out in the forefront. And when I looked at what had happened in Charlottesville, it, it reminded me of all the chaos and turmoil 
that went on in the late 50s and 60s because I was, I was a kid. And I remember seeing all that and just b- being scared, not understanding, and just, you know, being really upset because of the violence and the hate that was spewed. And we're not there, but we haven't, in my opinion, we haven't come as far as we could have. Um, because you have to teach hate. You have to teach someone that if somebody is different from them, you don't like them. We're not born that way. God did not create us that way. If you know God, God is love, and love is God. It's just that simple. So we need to, you know, kill our flesh, remind ourselves daily that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are to show people his way. And I said it Saturday. I'm not ashamed to say I'm a Christian. I'm not lost. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm supposed to do. Might not always be willing, you know, because I can get lazy and think like the microwave generation. Well, I want it right now. I don't want to wait. But I know that on this journey, there are trials and tribulations, and you have to go at the pace God has ordained you. So I don't mind that any longer. And the other thing, I am a follower of Christ. And back in the early days, they called it the way. So I know the way. I know how I'm supposed to be going, how I'm supposed to walk, how I'm supposed to treat people, that I'm supposed to season my talk with salt, which means that I don't let sharp tongue Leslie come out. I don't let sarcastic Leslie come out. I don't let oozy mouth killing Leslie come out. I am quiet. And a lot of times it's the spirit saying, keep your mouth shut. You don't need to say anything. You're not, if you're not gonna say anything positive, be quiet. And then the other piece to that is that the, the, the house that I'm under, the pastor I'm under, he's always telling us, you know, love people to life. You know, show love. You know, so I've been taught over the last seven years that I can't respond to how people might think about me. It's not personal. It's, it's their bias, their opinion. And I don't have to pick it up and put it on and walk around in it or feed in it. So I don't do that anymore. And it might hurt my feelings, but, you know, I can get over it and do whatever it is that I need to do. So I'm grateful that I have been taught and that I have been shown another way how to live life. And that is my prayer for the city of Boston, the state of Massachusetts, that we pick up the mantle and we show people, like we did on Saturday, that there is another way to do things, that we can state our opinions or our concerns without violence. You know, um, as they told us in treatment, you can agree to disagree. You know, and and that's the bottom line. I'm free to express my opinion, and you're free to express yours, but we don't have to fight about it. We can reach that, that balance, that happy medium that, you know, okay, that's what you believe, this is what I believe, but, you know, we can come on that common, common ground that this is our opinion and this is what we uh, are dealing with. Are you, Miss Venetia is here. Are you all right? Okay, God got you, so don't even worry about it. <laughs> so um, I, I'm grateful for the way things turned out in Boston, um, that, we, that God showed up and showed out, and that it was a peaceful event. And let that be the spark among us, the, the church, other people who are concerned about justice and racial equality, that we use that as our base, and then we jump, we jump start from there. Do you need another minute before you come up with a scripture? Um, huh? Yes, I have another Oh, okay. Um, so Venetia's here. She's getting her. Hey, guys, so she's getting her scriptures ready. First and foremost, you know what? Um, to God be the glory. Um, and again, I apologize to um, 
to uh, Boston Praise Radio, to um, my co-host Les, um, Deaconess, and um, everybody involved with this ministry. But I really have to give all the honor and glory to God for allowing me to be able to actually take care of me first to make sure that I'd be available to be here. I've never take um, appointments on Tuesday, and I don't know how it played out. I had nothing to do with it. But for a re- some reason or another, God showed up, <clears throat> and he showed out. Um, I do have a scripture, and um, and I sent it to me <laughs> because I was afraid I was going to lose it. But I just want to kind of check in real quick about, you know, um, what's going on with me. Um, uh, um, uh, how do I want to say this? Uh, hey, Minister Hobbs. God bless you. Uh, you know, me and, um, excuse me, um, Leslie and myself, you know, over the last seven years, you know, doing this assignment that God has called us to do, there's always been storms, trials, and tribulations. And um, and the other piece, too, is that, you know, you, for those that are, have been listening to us and supporting our ministry, we always talk about how, you know, being in recovery, we have to watch your triggers, your signals, you have to find out who you are and what can take you out if you allow it. And the number one thing, are for me that I learned with was relationships, um, whether if it's with a fiance, your partner, uh, family members, whatever. I'm not really going to get deep into something, you know, the situation, but something did come up um, in regards to, um, mm, mm, mm. you know, Lord, you know, you, you know, you got jokes. But this is what it is. This is what it's about. Um, it's about being honest and being transparent. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, something came up in regards to me. And um, there was um, some issues that had caused other issues to play out where I go for my health care uh, it was no. Uh, they were notified about someone's interpretation of what they thought they saw and what it kicked up for them. Because what they did, thinking that it was all about just them and me, they had caused an emergency meeting with the board, not the board, I'm sorry, with the doctors, where <clears throat> they had to have a discussion <sighs> Jesus, they had to have a discussion in regards to the acute patients and the chronic patients who were getting um, medication. I was on Tylenol with codeine for many years. I was on Percocet for many, many years. Um, but the Percocet, uh, it was starting to affect me where I would be on the air here at Boston Praise Radio, and I will find myself nodding, or, you know, you know, uh, not remembering the last bit of what we were just talking about. It was affecting me, and I went to my provider and said, hey, we got to do something. We have to get me off this stuff um, because I don't like how it makes me feel, and not more, but more importantly, I don't like how it my effect is. So they put me on another medication, and that medication is called Tramadol. So for many years, it was said that Tramadol was non-narcotic and, you know, blah, 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 blah. In 2011, they said, oh, Tramadol is a Schedule II uh, narcotic, and uh, it, it has narcotics in it. And um, let me tell you all this. <laughs> I was on trauma, though. I was taking 114 pills every two weeks. Mm-hmm. I did not realize the effect, not effect, but effect and effect that it had on me. I was not really 
think I was feeling and not thinking that this medication was wor not working for me. It was just ebbing the pain away, but it wouldn't take away the pain. It was this bandage, bandaging it. Um, my my co-host, my sister, my dear friend here had said something to me one day. She said, you know, I don't like how that stuff is making you feel. It's messing with your affect. I said, what are you talking about? And she told me what she saw and, and um, her observation, you know, basically she was straight and told me what, it, what she saw. To this day, I'm going to tell you, I did not remember that conversation because of the trauma drama. Mm -hmm. And when things started playing out and I was talking to her about some of the situations, she said, Nish, I told you. I told you that a long time ago. That was what was going on. And so then one of my other sisters um, also was telling me, um, uh, we, got, we have a prayer, uh, a prayer group, and as I was coming out the house, this happened two years ago, I'll never forget it. As I was coming out the house, her and her husband was waiting for me to take me to the group. And she said, I do not like how that medication is making her look. She looked like she's high as a kite. To me, I didn't feel that way, you know, or anything like that. But that's exactly, that's what the medication was doing. It looked like I was high off of heroin. Heroin is my choice of drug. You know, secondary is crack cocaine. But my main, the main one, it was heroin. I was addicted to it for many years. Um... I remember that conversation with her, and I went back to my doctor and I told her, "Listen, you got to take this. By this time, I'm taking 114 pills every two weeks. You got to knock this stuff down. It's affecting me. Um, where people are saying I look like I'm high off of heroin, and I, I, you know, I don't. Oh my God, I don't want ever no one to. I feel real hurt." I don't ever want no one to ever feel that I was high or I had relapsed off of heroin because when I was out there using and I was strung out on heroin, I lost trust in all my family members. I lost trust in all my friends. They couldn't trust me. And it hurted me to my heart that they had to run and hide their pocketbooks and, you know, watch out because you're about to come up here and manipulate somebody for some money. And I prayed to God. i never forget it. I was on a, at my mama's house on 8th Fountain Street. And I said, Lord, if you can get me off this heroin, mm -hmm. I promise you, I promise you I would never go back to it because I don't like not feeling untrustworthy. And... This is the time when um, I had relapsed. And um, so we're talking like 20-something years ago. And um, he did it. He took away the taste of heroin. I didn't want it no more. For three days, uh, my, my issue of uh, image veinness it all came up because everybody was uh, with, who was involved was trying to tell me well why don't you go back to at the kind of woman ink still existed well won't you go back to outpatient at woman ink won't you go here won't you go there mind you i'm in the field i'm a clinician now i'm so my image came right up oh no <laughs> i am not me i said no i'm not doing that what if i run into some one of my co-workers what if i run into some of my um ex-clients or clients oh uh, no i will not do that and because of my pride that pride is ugly because of my pride i went and i actually went into a place someone's home and for three days it was me and god three days me and god going through withdrawal you name it i did it everything i don't really want to go really in detail but whatever you go through for those who know when you go through withdrawal <clears throat> 
and you're not going through it through a detox where you're being managed and watched over, you <clears throat> you really go through withdrawals. You know, uh, loose bowels, throwing up, everything. I went through it. But on the third day, mm. Mm, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, on the third day, when I finally was released from that demon, that spirit, I was able to get up and walk out that house and never look back. Mm, you know, and I'm trying to tell you, it was nobody but God. It was nobody but God. I could have died. Uh, Leslie, she can, she can tell you right here, you know, when you go through... Uh, uh, withdrawals or your detoxing off of certain medication, uh, not medication, Lord Jesus, that ain't no med, that's a drug. Heroin, detoxing from that is horrific. You have to be under uh, medical care. And my medical care was God. You know, and now um, I could have died. I was doing 20 to 30 bundles a day. Smoking crack on top of that, you know. So on that third day when um, I was delivered, I was delivered. I was able to get up and walk away and never look back. So that's come up currently in the last month, uh, couple of years, uh, two years, one, you know, one a year. The trauma doll had the same effect as if you were on heroin, you know, I think <clears throat> mm. Satan's sneaky. He's slimy. He's slimy. He's so slimy. And the uh, what is it called? The FDA, the DEA, they feed right on into it. You know, basically, what had happened was I didn't get hooked back on heroin, but I became addicted to tramadol. My God, my God, my God. And if it wasn't for their information, if it wasn't for the people that were in my life that speak to speak love, but also speak life to me, you know, and say, hey, girl, you, this is serious. You got to do something about this. You know, I'm saying, but I'm not addicted, but I'm not addicted because in my mind, I didn't feel that I was addicted because it wasn't the same type of addiction withdrawal that I was going through with heroin. But I was addicted and did not know. And I justified it. I rationalized it. Oh, I'm chronic. I'm in chronic pain. I have to have this medication. You know, until God cures me like he healed me from hep C, like he healed me from um, uh, heroin, like he healed me to take away the taste of crack, I would say, this is totally, totally different. That was nobody but Satan himself sneaking out of Venetia's mouth. And so the bottom line to all this, I had to literally fight for my life. I had to fight for my life. I had to fight for my life and stop justifying and rationalizing, saying things, well, I'm in acute pain. I am this, I am that. And with the new laws, the only way where you can get you know, very strong narcotics is that you have to be in acute pain, where before it was chronic pain. So now what they have done is that acute pain, that means that basically that your pain ain't going nowhere and you're dying. So they have to give you something to make you comfortable. And I was fighting them. I was actually fighting the providers staying. Oh no, I'm in chronic pain. I'm this and that. And I know with chronic pain is the, for the rest of my life and it's not going to get any better unless God sh shows up himself. You know? And that's what I kept trying to use to keep getting the pills. Not realizing that I was 
trying to barter. I was trying to manipulate. I was trying to take advantage of the situation with me having these chronic illnesses to make sure that I would always have medication and I won't run out. I don't know, and I always said, okay, this is a thorn. This is a thorn like Paul had his thorn, you know, and, 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 and Jacob had his thorn and his heel when he wrestled the angel who was God, and he always had that limp to remind him what he went through when he was fighting the angel who we know was God himself. You know, I said, I'm, okay, it's a thorn. I'm going to have to live with it. But I'm going to make sure that I'm not going to be on pain when I do. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. We had a meeting this morning. I don't got all this stuff all up in my head. Mm-hmm. Serious con- hypochondria. Satan all up in my head. Written big time space. That ain't happened in years. You know, I get down to the clinic. And um, I sit down with my provider, and I said, um, so what are we going to do? What's going on? Mind you, I had gotten a phone call the night before, and it was told, told to me that these changes were, changes were happening. We're giving you a heads up, so don't be surprised if they tell you that you're not going to get your medication. Mm-hmm. You know, and I said, oh, my God. Well, you know something? In that room, I was able to go through withdrawal from heroin, and in three days, he delivered me. So if that's the case, I'm just going to have to go through it. Y'all, God, God, nobody but God, not but God, I'm trying to tell you, nobody but only God. I ain't want to say, but only God. Doctor walked in. Hey, Miss Simpson, how are you? Okay, you're following up. What's going on? I'm looking at him like he got 18 heads because I know we're supposed to be in this meeting because of the phone calls that came and the meetings that they had. And I'm saying, uh, we hear about the meeting, and he says, um, well, that, I, I'm not concerned with that. Um, what's going on? Because I was told something's going on with your hand. I said, what's going on? What's going on? And I'm like already prepared what I'm going to say. I had a dialogue. I was ready, you know. And the Lord himself just showed up and showed out in that room. And... I need to say I am so proud that I did not, I refused when my doctor said to me, all right, we got you from 114 every two weeks down to 90, down to 80, now to 70. He said, so what do you think we should do today? Mm. My God. (laughs) The old Venetia, that dope bean Venetia, and she was right there. Tell me you need 90 again. You're getting the muscular scale of the pain. I'm trying to tell you, this was actually going on. I had to actually call somebody before uh, the doctor came in to bust the dope because I had to tell, honestly, what was being but was being fed in my head. Like we've always talked about, me and Leslie, you have to be aware of Satan because you got to know who's talking. Is it God? Mm-hmm. Is it you? Or is Satan? And Satan had me like, hey, you know, tell him you need your back, you need your back up to the 90 because the skeleton pain, the skeleton pain is kicking you in your behind. Your hand is no good no more. You got sloken, um, uh, what is it, what is it, Leslie? Uh, circulation in your hand. You know, he's asking me, what do I need? What do I want? I said, this is a test. This is God. This is Jesus testing me. So I turned it back on him. I said, what do you think I need? He said, it's not about me. It's about you. 
what do you think you need? I know you're in pain with your hand, and we're going to make sure that you have, you know, you get help around that. But we're talking about the skeletal pain, the arthritis, because we know you're not on trauma draw for fibromyalgia because that does not work for fibromyalgia. So what do you want? And I looked at this man like he had lost his head. And in my mind, I'm saying, okay, I'm just going to say, well, like, just give me the 70, what we've been dealing with. And then before I can say anything, God touched that man's heart, and he said, I'm going to give you 15 pills. I said, um, did you say 50? I know what he said. He said 15. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, no, I said 15. I said, okay, I, I'm willing to work with you, but how is 15 pills going to help me? He said, the same way you was helped when you was on 114 every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, God. Glory, glory, glory to your name. Glory. Lord, thank you. And he said, the same way he helped you then, He's going to help you with them 15 pills. I said, Father God, and I bust out and started crying, and I just started praising him right then and there. I said, Lord, forgive me for being the fiend that I am. Lord, forgive me for me still wanting more, knowing that I know better. Mm. I had to take responsibility, own that, and remember something from 1991, I'm sorry, 1990, that this woman, Leslie Wilson, said to me and a group of AA when I was in treatment. And I remember saying, but... What am I going to do? How am I going to, how, I don't know how to do this. I don't, what am I going to do? How do, how am I going to, how am I going to not want to get high? And she said this to me, I shall never forget it. She said, Venetia, you're going to have to learn to nurture that side of who you are in your addiction. And then I looked at her with, like she had 10 heads. Because I'm like, what is she talking about? And meanwhile, we have other older people that, I'm not also older people, but older um, phases that were in the house on their way out. And they're like, you know, it was negative. But I heard her. I didn't understand, but I heard her. And then when she was able to regain the group, she's explained to me. And I'm quite sure everybody else that was in that room, you're going to have to learn how to nurture. And how you do that is that when you feel like getting high, you acknowledge it. I feel like getting high. You walk through it. You own it. You embrace it. You talk about it, but you don't act out on it. My God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Because now in 2017, everything that he has taught me from 1989 to 1991 at that program at 244 Townsend Street, he is now teaching me in a spiritual way. Amen. He gave it to me to make sure I got it, you know, um, uh, fleshly, you know, uh, mentally. But the spiritual piece, yes, and we did have that, thank you, God. But it's totally different. And everything that he's teaching me spiritually, he's relating it all the way back to the days of being in treatment at 244 Townsend Street. Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Father God. I thank you, Father God. I praise you. I glorify your name. Because 
You knew the plan. You knew the purpose. I didn't know, but you did. And you knew way back then that if I did what I was supposed to be doing, the day was going to have to come when he was going to have to come to me and teach me spiritually, not just about addiction, but a whole lot about me. And I don't mean to take up this time, but I truly believe this is so important. This is so important. You can go to therapists and see psychiatrists and you can all that, but they can't teach you what the Holy Spirit can. Amen. He, they can't do it. Amen. Because in their minds, if it's not t- uh, tangible, if you can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't see it, it don't exist. Mm. Amen. Say it. You Amen. understand me? Talk and about I'm it. trying to tell you. Talk about it. I'm trying to tell Talk you. Talk about it. Amen. It, he does exist. He's a miracle worker. Mm. He's yes, a he way maker. Yes, he, is. he does. He is. He he does miracles each and every day. It may not be a miracle where we can walk across the water. Mm. That, like that, you and Jesus did and try to teach Peter, but the miracles that he got today for us. Amen. My God is nobody but him. So I thank him and I glorify his name, but I thank him because he's teaching me so much about me today. Amen. And that's on a spiritual level and cleansing me on a spiritual level, you know, and I'm going to give it back to Leslie because I don't really have a scripture, but I guess I do. Last night I was talking to my child, the one who taught she was interpreting and thinking all hell was breaking loose because her mother was was gone, addicted to this medication. And we're sitting here, and she comes to me, and she says, something's about to happen. Revelations 12, 1 and 2. <laughs> I said, what would you say? She said, he keeps saying, I have to read Revelations 1 and 2. Two and a half years ago, that's what he did. He came, the Holy Spirit came to her and had her in the book of Revelations. Mm -hmm. He didn't have us go through Genesis and the the first uh, beginning of the book. He had her go backwards. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, well, what you talking about, Charlene? She said, he's saying Revelations 1 and 2 Mm -hmm. and Genesis I said, Genesis, that's the beginning. And I said, what is he saying? She said, Ma, I don't know. That's why I'm coming to you. You should know. <laughs> so I'm saying, I told I know about I know about the lady, um, the woman. I know I know it has something to do with the dragon, and I know it has something to do with the baby, the seed. I said, but I don't understand what he's trying to say. What does he want? What is he trying to get us to get? In the book of Revelations, I can't remember the verse. Um, I believe it's chapter 5. And I'm just going to paraphrase it real quick. It's when Adam and Eve get busted Mm -hmm. of eating the fruit. And God gives um, his, uh, (laughs) his commandment, his punishment to Satan. He said, you're going to always be on your belly. You're going to slither around. And you... And her will always be enemies, including with her offsprings. Mm. My God, mm. my God, my God. Then he had me go back to Revelation 1 and 2. And in, in the book of Revelation 1 and 2, matter of fact, is 1 and 2, 5 to 7. Listen, I just went through the entire thing. I wanted to know the three components. What does it mean about the woman, the dragon, and the seed? The woman was God's children, God's people. Who was going to deliver Jesus, the baby? 
the dragon was Satan waiting for her. Oh, let me stop. She had a, a, a crown on her head with 12, I, I just want to say, tear or 12 pieces of tear, which represent the tribes. But she, the woman, was God's children. And Satan was waiting. She was about to deliver and give birth. And Satan's waiting right there for her. So when the baby come out, he can gobble up the baby. And in parentheses, it says, Jesus. And then it says, go back to Genesis, chapter 5. And when I went back to Genesis, chapter 5. I got it. God predicted in Genesis, in chapter 5, that that day when he told the snake and Eve <coughs> that in the future that it was coming. It was coming. He was going to come out to Jesus. And he was going to come out to Jesus. Um, uh, uh, Jesus and all God's children. And I've seen that scripture so many times. I've heard it been taught to me. I heard it, I heard it, I heard it. But last night at 1.30 this morning, I got it. He predicted that when Eve's offsprings, whatever came out of Eve, and it was related to God and his children, Satan was going to come by any means necessary. And there are so many different ways that he tried to have him um, to how he, how he had it, uh, to get at him. The crucifixion, he was all behind that. He, yeah, there was a way that something was going on with Judas where he allowed Satan to get at him. But Satan had his hands all over that. You understand what I'm saying? There were so many uh, episodes in, in, in the Bible that explains how many times Satan tried to get kill him and it started when he first was born and so for me all I can say is I thank you because I never knew that I never knew he predicted that and that it was going to happen in revelations I never seen it God predicted that he said it you and Satan will be enemies. And any offsprings that you have will be an enemy of Satan. My God. And in the book of Revelation, when it says the woman, the woman is God's children. They're the saints. You know, they're us, those that walk in Christ. And he's trying to take us out. He's, he couldn't, he, 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 he's doing everything in his power to come at us. You know, I may sound like I'm all over the place, but I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I'm grateful. I'm so grateful because I try, I'm telling you, I didn't think that I would understand. I had a conversation with my pastor a couple of weeks ago. I said, I don't think I know how to do A, B, and C, and D, but just put me in the choir. I, that's part of my ministry. So I'll sing to the highest balcony if I can just touch one soul when I'm singing in the choir and I can touch one soul. I did my assignment because I'll never, and they said, never say never. I'll never know how to connect stuff like that, how you all connect. And he did it. Just like Amen. he did it this morning. Amen. Just like he, he does it every day. He's the same as he was like, Leslie said Sunday when she opened up to the, uh, to open up the word um, for Sunday broadcast. He's the same as he was yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I just have one thing to say. Give him a chance. Let him in. He's not a forceful God. He's a God of love. He 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 gives you free will. Let him let him let him help you. Because nobody can help you like he can. Amen. So please, I beg you. I yield to you. Give yourself a chance because you deserve it. That song, you deserve it. 
Are you talking about God? It's also about you. You deserve to be of the pre-oil priesthood and be under his covenant. He didn't be in love by him. You deserve it. He's already had plans for you. And if you don't know how to do it, just say, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I need help. All of a sudden, somebody's going to be ringing on the phone, somebody knocking on your door, and they're going to be earthly angels that he has provided for you to be able to help you. All I got to say is, glory be to God, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you. I love everybody that you have put in my life that has opened my eyes, has opened my ears. My God, my God, thank you, Jesus. I just say thank you. Thank you for blessing me and thank you for having patience with hard headedness. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Leslie because I can go on and on. I'm sorry if I took up the time, but I just have to say this is so, so important. Oh my God. I'm, oh my God. I'm just, I'm just so. I'm just so grateful. It's nobody like him. Nobody. Mm. It's nobody like him. And you give yourself a chance. Let him love you. You may not love yourself, but let him love you because he'll teach you how to love yourself. I look at these young girls out we here. <laughs> And I see how they are, and I can tell that they don't love themselves, they don't know, but they think they're cute, they think they got it going on. And I can remember when, but they don't know they're in the hands and the clutches of Satan and his captains and his princesses. Please, help yourself, and I will keep you in prayer. Amen. Amen. Jesus. My God, my God. Oh, God, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We want to thank you, Vanisha, for being so transparent. We talked about it yesterday that, uh, especially in our community, how we place the doctors on a pedestal and we think they're God and they tell us, well, you need to take this medicine and take that medicine and this might be the side effect. And they say it with a smile or they make real light of it. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is whatever you put in your body affects you. Amen. There is an action. There is a consequence. And we don't challenge the doctors. We, oh, he knows so much. He's not a God. You know, don't make, you know, the small G. He's no God. He's man. He's human. And whatever gifts he has, whatever information he has, whatever skills he has, God has endowed him with that. Amen. So you give credit to God first. You use the medical advice. But like the conversation we had yesterday, you have to learn to advocate for Come yourself. On now. You cannot just take the doctor's word and say, okay, my doctor said. No, you challenge your doctor. You go in there with a list of questions and say, well, if I do this, what's going to happen? What's going to be the side effect? How long do I have to take it? You know, what doses do I need to start up? Because a lot of times they put you at the highest dose and we see how that affects your body. And then they try to treat you down. No, you ask them. All those questions because they're important. And you need to remember that all the information you give the doctor, bottom line, that's how he makes his decision on how to treat you. So you have to open up your mouth. And you can't say, oh, I'm okay, nothing's bothering me, no pain. No, you need to get real honest and tell them what's bothering you, how it makes you feel, what effect it has on your lifestyle. Because some of the medications that you take are going to change your lifestyle. Amen. And you have to be aware of that. You just can't go along and get along. You need to challenge the doctors and ask specific questions. And part of the problem, as I see it, in my opinion, in my observation, that we're so empathetic. We think, well, the doctor said it, so it has to be right. He can make mistakes. He's not perfect. He's, he's human. Amen. And, and um, our hospital, our main hospital in the Boston area, is a teaching hospital. That's great. That's wonderful. But you got to remember, they're teaching people how to be doctors. And in essence, again, in my opinion, we're guinea pigs. 
because they will try medications on us, which they get money for. They will see how this works. So maybe they're writing a paper. We need to be aware of all of that and not just keep our mouths shut. We need to advocate for ourselves. If you can't advocate for yourself, then bring somebody with you that will advocate for you. But, you know, there's an expression, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. If you don't challenge them, they're not going to change anything at all. They will just keep filling you with medication, um, and they will do a check-in, you know, once a month or every six weeks, whenever it is that they see you. And once again, they're going by the information that you give them, so they, knew, so they know how they should proceed. You know, and that's very powerful. We don't realize how much power is in that because, again, they make their diagnosis on the information that we give them. Yeah, they look in their medical textbooks and all of that, and they go to their supervisors, and they go online and all that. But we are giving them the basic information that they need to make that diagnosis. So it's real important that you be clear, you be concise, and that you ask and challenge them with your questions and also with your integrity so that they know because a lot of times when they find out you're in recovery they're like well oh, they just they just trying to get more meds Amen. and in some cases that's true but it's not in all cases and when a patient comes in because they red flag your files i can tell you that from personal experience you need to let yeah um, I took this, I took that, but I'm in recovery now, so don't keep that label on me. Amen. You know, this is where I'm at now. That's where I was 20 years ago. There's a totally different person. So I'm not trying to get extra medication because I don't need it. I don't want it. And while you were talking, what God gave to me was about when you said about revelations. That's New World Order. Learning to live without drugs is new world order. Yeah. That's a new lifestyle. Yeah. That's a new change in our routine. And for a lot of people, when they first come into recovery, that's the hardest thing for them to do because they're, again, relying on the doctors, telling them that they need X, Y, and Z. And back in the day when I started in the field, they didn't want you on medication. You know, they wanted you to just deal with whatever you was going with. And now, a day's... You're on medication first, and then they tell you to deal with it. But if you don't have clear thinking, how can you deal with whatever the life issue is that's pressing on you? Because your head, your system is full of medication. So I implore you to advocate for yourself, to tell the doctors um, what it is that you need, not what they want to give you, what you need. So it's real important that you take care of you because nobody else is going to do it. And we're starting to run out of time. So this can, be, uh, this can be a discussion for another week that we can go on and we can go in more depth with that. But as Venetia said, if you're struggling with your medication, pray that God deliver you so that you can think clear-headed and that you can advocate strongly for yourself and then you and your doctor sit down and decide what is the best course of action for you. I want to thank you for tuning in and listening. This has been the Recovery Connection, Saving Our Souls. And we pray for you. We keep you in mind when we talk, when we think. Whatever we do, you are always in our mind because without you, we would not be on the air. And we thank Pastor Wall and his staff for allowing us to talk and to preach, whatever, however you want to label it, but for allowing us to be transparent so that we can help somebody else because of the help that we received over the years. And we want to thank you once again. Be blessed. Have a good week. And we will talk.